I want to tell you a story about a little boy named Ben. Ben is two and a half years old, and Ben has brain cancer. And Ben's really happy. He's happy because he's been through two rounds of chemo and radiation, and he feels good for once. He doesn't feel yucky, and his father's enjoying seeing Ben's happiness. But as the father tells the story of Ben and his cancer, the father's voice begins to break. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to play with Ben because Ben thinks everything is wonderful, but I know something that Ben doesn't, that Ben's dying. And he talks about how difficult it is to play with Ben, knowing that in three or six months, Ben will be dead. And yet Ben is so happy, he's so beautiful. And so the father tries as hard as he can to enjoy Ben, to be joyful around Ben. But then he says in the middle of this short story that it's an amazing thing to know how little time one has left. And as he says that statement, he has merged himself with his son. It's as if the father himself is dying. So in my laboratory, we've studied this story extensively. And what we found is that two primary emotions were elicited. One is distress and the other is empathy. At the same time, when we asked people what they felt after the story was over, we really couldn't get very clear answers. So we began doing other studies on this story. So we took blood before and after, and we found that the brain produced two interesting chemicals. One is called cortisol, which focuses our attention on something important. So cortisol correlated with our sense of distress. So the more distress you felt, the more cortisol you released, and the more you paid attention to that stimulus. The second chemical release is called oxytocin, which is associated with care and connection and empathy. And oxytocin was correlated with people's sense of empathy. And the more oxytocin they released, the more empathic they felt towards Ben and his father. Now, we did something different after this experiment. We gave individuals a chance to share money with a stranger in the lab. And indeed, those who produced both cortisol and oxytocin were more likely to donate money generously to a stranger they couldn't see in the lab. In another experiment, we gave individuals a chance to donate money to a charity that works with children who are ill. And indeed, those who released oxytocin and cortisol donated money to this charity. And in fact, the amount of oxytocin released predicted in both cases how much money people would share with a stranger or with charity. What we're seeing is that this narrative is changing behavior by changing our brain 